Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining the webinar. Today's presentation, Navigating Avian Influenza, Your Questions Answered, is part of USDA's Defend the Flock campaign, promoting awareness about the importance of biosecurity and how to prevent the spread of infectious poultry diseases like highly pathogenic avian influenza, or HPAI for short. I'm Susan Cohen, and I will be your host today on behalf of USDA's Animal and Plant Health Inspection Service, which is known as APHIS. Today's session will include an overview of avian influenza, an update on the status of the disease here in the US, and answers to questions that are frequently asked about HPAI. At the end of the program, we'll answer some of your questions live and provide online destinations for free resources that will help you defend your flocks. Today, I am joined by Dr. Patricia Fox, National Epidemiology Officer for the Poultry Health Team at USDA APHIS. Dr. Fox leads the preparedness, surveillance, and response activities for the US Avian Influenza Program and is also an instructor of epidemi epidemiology training workshops for veterinary professionals in the surveillance and control of avian influenza around the globe. Thank you for joining us today, Dr. Fox. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. Maggie Baldwin, State Veterinarian and Director of the Animal Health Division at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. Dr. Baldwin is responsible for animal health and disease control activities and formerly served as a veterinary medical officer with USDA APHIS during the 2014 through 2016 HPAI, HPAI outbreak. Dr. Baldwin, thank you for being here with us today. Thanks so much, Susan, I'm happy to be here. A few housekeeping items to, to share before we start. Real-time streaming captions are available for this program. To view, click on the CC bar in the bottom of the screen, or for customizable captions, type the caption URL that you see on this slide. That's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash A P H I S all caps, the word web with a capital W underscore Feb, like the month with a capital F, then two eight underscore capital C, capital C, all this into your browser. The URL appears on every slide if you didn't get it. And um, please note that uh, the letters are case sensitive. To submit questions, click the Q&A button located at the bottom of your screen as shown here. We will address as many questions as possible during today's session. However, if you submitted a question that was not answered, don't worry. Written responses will be posted along with a recording of this webinar on the Defend the Flock website. Be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter to find out when the responses and recording are available. We'll share those online destinations at the end of the webinar. Dr. Fox, can you start us off by describing what highly pathogenic avian influenza is? Sure. There are four types of influenza or flu viruses, A, B, C, and D. Each species has their own influenza viruses. For avian influenza viruses, wild aquatic birds, including gulls, terns, shorebirds, and wild waterfowl, such as ducks, geese, swans, etc., are considered reservoirs or hosts for avian influenza A viruses. Avian influenza or bird flu refers to the disease that's caused by these avian influenza viruses. 
These viruses naturally spread among wild aquatic birds worldwide and can infect domestic poultry and other bird species. It is generally uncommon for avian influenza viruses to infect other animal species or humans. Low pathogenic avian influenza and high pathogenic avian influenza categories refer to the molecular characteristics of a virus and the virus's ability to cause disease and death in chickens in a laboratory setting. Most avian flu subtypes are low pathogenic avian influenza and cause little or no signs of illness in domestic or wild birds and pose no threat to human health. These subtypes are found every year in waterfowl. The subtype responsible for the outbreak that began in 2021 is highly pathogenic, causing significant illness and death in poultry, so is of heightened concern. Next, we'll briefly discuss the current status of the highly pathogenic avian influenza outbreak in the U.S. As of February 26, 2023, APHIS has confirmed highly pathogenic avian influenza in 47 states. This affects 774 premises and over 58 million birds. These premises included 418 commercial flocks and 356 backyard or pet bird flocks. Next, we'll go through some frequently asked questions about highly pathogenic avian influenza. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Why do we get started? Dr. Baldwin, what animals carry highly pathogenic avian influenza and how does it spread? Great, great question, Susan. And um, Dr. Fox touched on this a little bit in her overview of what highly pathogenic avian influenza is, but primarily um, the, the host species for HPAI is wild birds. Um, and that can be what we think of typically as our waterfowl and shorebird species. So things like our geese and ducks um, are the, the primary um, reservoir species for this virus that we're seeing right now. But we're also seeing it in some other wild bird species that we hadn't seen in previous outbreaks, um, our raptors and birds of prey, things like owls and hawks and eagles. So USDA is currently tracking all of the different species that have been affected with avian influenza on their website. There is a, a website called 2022-2023 um, Detections of Highly Pathogenic Avian Influenza, and that lists all of the different species and all of the different types of birds that have been affected in this outbreak. And these infected birds are primarily shedding the virus in their droppings and in, in their respiratory droplets, um, in their saliva, so their bodily discharges and, and feathers from infected birds. So these, these birds are carrying a lot of virus and they're shedding a lot of virus as they fly and as they move around. Um, so people that come in contact with wild birds that may be affected or infected by this virus can also act as sort of a vector for that disease or a vector for that virus. Even though people may not become infected or become sick with the virus, we can carry the virus just like we carry other germs on our body and on our shoes, on our clothing, or if we're using equipment, um, if there's equipment that comes in contact with sick birds that are affected by the virus, that equipment can also carry the virus and, and potentially spread it to other birds, whether that be other wild birds or our domestic poultry as well. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. Dr. Fox, what are the signs and symptoms of HPI, HPAI that flock keepers should watch out for? Well, whereas low pathogenic avian influenza in poultry often shows little or no symptoms, unfortunately, often the first sign of high path AI is sudden death of the birds. More subtle signs may include diarrhea, lack of energy, or decreased food or water consumption. You might notice some misshapen eggs or eggs with very soft shells, you might have some flu-like symptoms, including nasal discharge, coughing, sneezing, or snicking, as we call it. More obvious signs that you might look for would be swelling of the head and eyelids, 
swelling of the combs, wattles, or legs. And sometimes you might see purple discoloration of the wattles, combs, or legs. The birds may be very incoordinated or may just sit in one place and not move, not even to get food or water. You might also see a very strange curling of the neck as in the lowest picture. That's called torticollis and is one of the signs that is almost pathognomonic for avian influenza or, or another disease that we look out for called Newcastle disease. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Dr. Baldwin, what can bird owners do to reduce the risk of HPAI infecting their flocks? Yeah, great question, Susan. And I think this is one of the most important things for all of the webinar participants to know is how can you keep your birds safe and how can you keep your birds healthy? So the most important thing, of course, with this virus being carried and shed and spread by wild birds is really keeping that separation between your domestic poultry and wild birds. So keeping those wild birds away from um, your food sources, your water sources, making sure that you have um, coverings to prevent them from getting access to your flock at home. And all of these tips, what's really important to remember is this is really going to be site specific or premises specific. So there's not really a one size fits all for biosecurity. And that's the importance in the Defend the Flock program is that you can walk through that program and get all of those tools and tips and tricks on how to apply biosecurity practices to your premises, to your farm and your home and, and your, your barn to keep your flock safe. So some of that might be keeping your birds indoors during those periods of migration when, when we're concerned that we're going to have more wild birds um, and keeping them, you know, confined a little bit more to reduce that risk of interaction with wild birds. Um, of course, keeping that your feed uh, enclosed and away from contamination from wild birds. If those wild birds are shedding that virus again in their, their saliva and their feces, if they have access to your feed bins and access to your water sources, they can shed that virus into feed and water and, and easily transmit that virus to your domestic poultry flock. So really important to keep your feed spills cleaned up and keep your water sources covered to keep those wildlife and wild birds out of there. Um, national Poultry Improvement Plan is another really important um, national program that there's a lot of uh, diagnostic testing that happens and, and there's birds um, and flocks that are HPAI free. So there's, there's birds and flocks that, that they are routinely doing testing for highly pathogenic avian influenza. So if you are buying birds, making sure that you're buying from NPIP participating flocks is going to be really important. Next slide. And then, of course, we, as we already mentioned, we need to be um, very cognizant of all of the different ways that, that the virus could spread in and around a farm as well. So if we are using equipment, if we are using tools, making sure that you're using separate equipment that may not be contaminated from one area to another. So if you're handling manure with shovels and rakes, you don't want to be handling your feed with those same shovels and rakes. And any sort of equipment that you use, make sure is always cleaned and disinfected and not shared between flocks, not shared between premises, um, but really keep those site specific and premises specific. The other important thing is as we walk around our farms, as we walk around our environments and our home areas, is making sure that you're not wearing those same shoes into where your flock is kept, whether that be a, um, in your yard or your barn or another confined space. But it's very, very easy for that virus to be tracked and carried on the bottom of your shoes. So making sure that you have a dedicated pair of boots or shoes or covers that you can put over your shoes so you're not tracking any virus into your flock area um, with, with you know, potential contamination on your shoes. And as always, a good practice is, is just washing your hands for any sort of germ prevention, um, just like, like it is for people, washing your hands and making sure that you're not carrying any, any um, virus or any sort of germs on your hands into your flock. 
Another really important thing, and we, we, we'd really encourage everybody to right now maintain a closed flock by not introducing new birds um, because new birds can be a source of infection. If you do get new birds, um, or if you do take your birds to a different area and commingle with others and then return home, it's really important to isolate any new birds coming onto your, your farm or your coming into your flock, isolate those separately for up to 30 days um, before you introduce them to your flock. And that gives you enough time to make sure that those birds are not harboring any virus, that they're not sick, and, and hopefully they don't um, pose a potential risk for infection um, to your flock. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Dr. Baldwin, are humans at risk of getting HPAI? And are there food safety concerns that we should be aware of? Well, fortunately, according to the CDC, the risk to humans from this particular virus is very low. You might have heard of human cases of avian influenza or bird flu in Asia. This is a different strain called H1N1 that's never been found in the US to this time. So, so far we're quite lucky with this virus is it not affecting humans at all. You also can't get avian influenza by eating properly cooked eggs or poultry or by handling or cooking poultry products. However, there are some other diseases we need to be worried about such as salmonella when we're handling raw poultry products. So you do wanna make sure that you handle those carefully, um, cook them properly, and clean and disinfect the kitchen area where they're being prepared to protect your family from those other things we might be worried about. Though in this case, not highly pathogenic avian influenza. So highly pathogenic avian influenza affects poultry, not people. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. And finally, Dr. Baldwin, uh, a question that we know that so many people want to understand as flock keepers, um, what, what can or should you do if you're concerned if your flock is infected? Yeah, thank you, Susan, for that question. It's, it's a really important question. Uh, probably the next most important to practicing good biosecurity is if you do suspect your flock is sick, um, or that you suspect your flock has avian influenza, uh, it's really important to report those to the, the state or to USDA. Um, and we work together all of the time. So if you report it to one, um, the other is also going to be in touch. So, so it's, it's important because highly pathogenic avian influenza is a foreign animal disease. And there are uh, appropriate steps that we have to take in lab testing. So we dispatch what we call a foreign animal disease diagnostician. These are, are federally trained veterinarians that know how to collect the right samples for diagnostic testing for avian influenza. And they'll go out and collect those samples. So it's really important that that's reported promptly so we can get those veterinarians out to your your farm or your home and collect those samples and either rule in or rule out avian influenza. There's a lot of other diseases that poultry get and some of it can look very similar to avian influenza. So it's really important that we rule that out or rule that in um, depending on the, the different clinical signs that we might be seeing. So by doing that, you can contact your veterinarian. So if you have a veterinarian you're working with, you can contact that veterinarian and, and they will be in touch with us and make sure that we follow, like I said, those, those appropriate sampling protocols for avian influenza testing. You can also contact your local cooperative extension office. Again, those folks know how to get in touch with us and, and walk through that same process. And then depending on which state you live in, you may have a board of animal health in your state, or you may have a state veterinarian's office. Um, there's a lot of different names and a lot of different you know, things that they're called, but we all do the, essentially the same thing. We're responsible for animal health and disease control activities in our state. So in, in my state, in Colorado, I'm the state veterinarian at the Colorado Department of Agriculture. So we're in the Department of Agriculture, but some may be a board of animal health. Just know in your state who is who's the most appropriate party to call. And then of course, if you still aren't sure, you can always call the USDA number. The USDA number 
number will route to the right state and make sure that we have the right people doing the follow-up in those states. And that number is 866-536-7593. Again, that USDA number is 866-536-7593. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin, and thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, we really appreciate you sharing these insights. I know this is valuable information for everyone who owns or cares for birds. And now we want to hear from all of you who are participating in this session today. Again, to submit questions, click the Q&A button that's located at the bottom of the screen. And remember, if we don't get to your question live today, we will be collecting all of the questions from today's session and posting answers along with a recording of this webinar on the Defend the Flock website at a later date. Now, I, uh, we've been, thank you for all the questions that have been coming in. We've been seeing a bunch of questions, uh, Dr. Fox, about whether USDA has guidance for growers and backyard flock owners about what types of prevent protective actions can be taken when there are other animals, could be swine, could be other livestock, or even other birds, even songbirds um, on the premises. What can be done to and uh, either to protect uh, against the spread or if you if you know that there has been an outbreak. Well, thanks for that. That's really getting back to what we were talking about with biosecurity and protecting your animals from the viruses. Um, having other species should not be an issue like swine. And we have seen that many uh, bird species in this particular outbreak um, are not only carrying the virus, but also becoming ill from the virus. So one of the biosecurity things we really want to do is to exclude any other birds from our structures to the extent possible. So we really need to try to keep those songbirds, starlings, things like that, um, away from our flocks, away from our barns, certainly not nesting in the eaves, um, covering up any of those areas um, with wire or some other way to keep them out. Um, what we wanna do is keep out any wild birds that may have the opportunity to get in and, and spread this disease via their, their feces. Um, so that's a really good question. That's the best thing that we can do is to exclude any other um, birds from the premises. Um, I know some backyard flock owners also have ducks and ducks are one of the species that don't necessarily get sick from highly pathogenic avian influenza, but they can spread it to the chickens and some of the other animals. And very often your domestic ducks uh, like to go out in that pond where you also have wild ducks. And when we've got this active outbreak going on, it's really recommended that is not allowed. So as much as that might um, feel like it's restricting those animals and, and not fair to them. Um, if you're going to have a mixed flock of, of ducks and chickens, you, you want to keep those ducks away from the other birds. So really, it's all about biosecurity and excluding birds from your flocks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, Dr. Baldwin, we're seeing a lot of questions from people who are saying that usually at this time of year, they get their meat birds from a hatchery. Is it safe to bring those birds into the coop or house or should, or some of our uh, participants are asking whether they should get new birds at all? Yeah, great question. And um, this is one that we're getting a lot ahead of show and fair season as well. So I think, you know, one of the important things is, um, like I mentioned during that, how do we prevent the spread um, is, is to really try to maintain a closed flock if you can. And, and that might be that you, you can introduce birds at some point in time, but after that isolation period. So you know, one thing is, is going to be buying from the National Poultry Improvement Plan, the NPIP, participating flocks that are testing for avian influenza. So you know that flock 
has routine surveillance and hopefully the risk of them bringing avian influenza to your flock is going to be low. So looking for that NPIP participant is gonna be important. And then if you do acquire new birds and you bring those birds home, is going to be isolating those birds for you know, up to a month and, and keeping them away from the rest of your flock before you introduce them. Again, the goal in that isolation period is to give you enough time to make sure those birds are not sick and those birds do not have avian influenza and, and you know, don't bring that into your flock. So there are some ways to reduce the risk, um, but the most important thing if, if you do bring birds in is again, NPIP flocks and isolating. Otherwise we do recommend maintaining closed flocks. Thanks, Dr. Baldwin. There's a follow-up question that I think um, might be worth exploring at this time. Um, one of our participants said that, um, you know, we've talked about confining birds during outbreaks, but it seems like, you know, a year later, we're still in the outbreak. So what qualifies as an outbreak? And I guess, how do you know when it's okay to let your birds back out? Yeah, that is an excellent question too, because um, we are in this ongoing outbreak situation. We're now a year into this with highly pathogenic avian influenza. And what we are seeing is, is it does tend to increase during certain times of the year, and then we see fewer cases in other times of the year. But the risk is always pretty present. Um, we're seeing avian influenza really anywhere that we see wild birds, and we're not testing every wild bird. So, you know, it's really important to assume if you have a, a reservoir um, of wild birds in your area, if you have those reservoir species, even those that we typically don't think of reservoir species, it's important to just accept that there's probably avian influenza circulating. And one thing that we do acknowledge is it's really challenging for bird health to keep them indoors all the time, um, that, you know, especially those that are not used to being housed indoors all the time. It, it gets really challenging. This is something we've walked through with a lot of our, our zoo facilities and those that have specialty bird collections, is how do we maintain that balance of keeping the birds safe and healthy, but also uh, maintaining their mental health and you know being able to exhibit their normal behaviors. Um, so I think it's just really important to look at what you can do for your flock. And it may not be that you maintain them inside the coop or inside a barn all the time, but maybe you do let them out for certain periods of the day under a covered run. So they're still not gonna be exposed to those wild birds that may be shedding droppings over the area. Um, but there, there is a, a balance that we have to reach because we're in this prolonged outbreak period. And it's really hard to tell when the risk is greater or when the risk is less because the wild birds really are everywhere. And we're seeing this in so many different wild bird species that, that we haven't seen before. So I hope that answers that question, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin. We'll, uh, we'll give you a break and uh, direct the next question to Dr. Fox. Can you help us understand, Dr. Fox, why is this outbreak worse than in 2015? Well, I wish I had the answer to that. That's the $64 million question. I'd be um, ready, to, ready to retire with all the money I'd make over that. Um, we don't really know. Um, what we do know is a couple of things is that in this case, um, most of a majority of the flocks that are being affected are being affected directly from wild birds. Uh, we have much less farm to farm spread this time than we did in 2015. So that's a good thing. That means that our biosecurity is working. But what we don't understand um, is why so many birds are carrying it such long distances and for such a long period of time. So we did know um, previous to us having this outbreak that Europe had it ongoing for several years and we were afraid it was gonna hit us in the last several years. And so far it's been a year. So we don't know why this one is so much worse. What we do know is that some of our activities, meaning biosecurity, are keeping it much better than it could be because we're getting it from the wild birds. So we wanna be careful about not tracking that in as Dr. Baldwin has talked about. Um, but at the same time, we're doing a better job of not transmitting it between different flocks within our industry. 
So um, we hope that um, in the coming spring, maybe it decreases. Unfortunately, as mentioned, spring is the time of year where usually it increases. And over time, we hope that the birds themselves um, have uh, a higher resistance to it and, and don't transmit it as much. But so far, that's all we can say. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, Dr. Fox and Dr. Baldwin, I think I'll uh, put this question to both of you and um, I'll let you jump in as, as you see fit. As you can imagine, we're getting a lot of questions about vaccines. Is there a vaccine being worked on? How come there isn't one? Uh, how would it, you know, what birds would be, uh, would it be safe for? Uh, so anything you can tell us about the status of vaccines that um, to protect our flocks from HPAI would be greatly appreciated. Dr. Well, Fox, this, did you want to take that one first from the USDA side? Sure. Um, so I was just about to say, nationally, um, we do have a group together that is looking at the possibility of vaccination. Um, right now, there are um, several issues with vaccination that we're trying to work through. Um, one of being that we don't have a licensed vaccine yet. They are being worked on. And just like your... Um, flu vaccines that you have to get every year. Every single strain requires a different vaccine. Um, so it's not like we could have stockpiled some vaccine um, from 2015 and, and had it ready to go for this outbreak. Um, the vaccine has to be made as the strain um, shows itself, not unlike the, the COVID vaccines and, and the avian influenza vaccines that you get. One of the other issues is um, that we have to be able to tell the difference between vaccinated animals and unvaccinated animals, and that's called a DIVA strategy. Um, some vaccines, that's very easy to do. Other vaccines, that's more difficult to do. And so we need to look at a vaccine candidate where we can tell the difference between vaccinated and unvaccinated animals. And certainly we need to look at the expense of vaccines and whether it, it's worth it from a business standpoint um, for the poultry industry to utilize them or whether it's possible to get one out there that potentially is used in, for instance, backyard flocks and zoo collections, but not used in our commercial poultry industry uh, based on trade and all sorts of other things. Um, that's not the primary issue that we're having. The biggest one is what we just talked about, is that the virus itself um, is being spread more from wild birds coming in and their droppings getting tracked in than it is from bird to bird to bird. So if we vaccinated some flocks, um, they would be protected from, from the wild bird, but you're not going to have a, a, a protection between the flocks of a vaccinated flock versus an unvaccinated flock because that's not the way it's, it's being transmitted. So you're constantly having these drops a virus into the population, you'd have to continuously vaccinate those birds over and over and over again. And for long lived birds, um, like your egg layers and your turkeys, that would probably become one of those situations where it's not possible to do it. You can't um, deal, you know, give an injection to say 2 million birds in any period of time that would be reasonable, rational, or doable. So we do have uh, groups that are working on this, and it is being discussed all the way up to the president's office. Um, so we are looking at it, but we want to make sure that we do it properly, and we want to make sure that we do it um, so that we're helping out the industry and not hurting the industry and helping out backyard flock owners and zoo collections and things like that and not harming them. I hope that helped with some of the answers. Yes, thank you, Dr. Fox. Dr. Baldwin, did you want to add to that? I think Dr. Fox hit all of the points. Okay, all right. Um, thank you, Dr. Fox. We're seeing a lot of questions about how HPI actually spreads. And Dr. Fox, this might be another question for you. Um, we're seeing uh, questions about, can it be transmitted through the air? You know, what's, how does it actually 
what's the mechanism from getting from wild birds to poultry? And then how long does the HPA virus last in wild bird droppings in feces and saliva? So there's a lot of parts to that, but I think you understand um, the thrust of it, Dr. Fox. All of those are really good questions. And it goes back to exactly why we recommend all the biosecurity measures that we do. So first of all, it is spread based on feces and secretions. So that would also include um, saliva and ocular secretions and things like that. But obviously the most common way is gonna be through fecal contamination. So assuming that you have a Canada goose that comes by your property, it loves the pond um, and it, it drops its feces there, that feces then has to be introduced to your flock. So either by tracking it in or um, by a uh, rodent or insect tracking it into your barns, that's also possible, um, or other birds tracking it in. Um, so then that just like any other avian or any other flu virus um, that can be transmitted um, to that one chicken and then that chicken coughs, sneezes, snicks, defecates, and it's transmitted to the rest of the flock. So what we talk about is how much virus is in these secretions. So again, we talk about the fecal route being most common. The good news about all avian influenza viruses is that they're pretty easy to kill. So any disinfectant that would be working on things like salmonella or COVID or anything else is going to kill avian influenza. Um, it's not difficult to kill. So we talk about cleaning and disinfection, really good washing with a detergent will do it. Um, we have specialty things out there like Vircon that we use. Uh, a very mild bleach solution will work. It's very simple to kill. Um, it, between birds, um, they're, once they become infected, um, they defecate an amazing amount of virus in a very short period of time, which is why it will go from one bird to an entire barn full of turkeys in 24 to 48 hours. And so it's that amount of virus that they're, that they're putting out. That's one of the reasons why we actually want to depopulate those flocks as fast as possible because they're little virus machines. So once that virus hits the ground though, um, we like the tincture of time. So drying it out, very high heat, ultraviolet light, all those things outdoors kills it very quickly. In a moist environment, it can last a long time. So we look at disinfecting our boots, disinfecting our tools, things like that with something um, a little bit stronger, especially if it's on the moist fecal material. Um, but it is pretty easy to kill and the environment will handle it in usually less than 14 days in a manure pile that is um, drying. So, and we talk about the um, period of time for which birds may or may not transmit virus. Again, usually the birds die, um, but if they live, they can transmit the virus for a very long period of time, um, which is why um, some birds that may not show that they're ill also would need to be depopulated so that they don't make all the other birds in a flock ill. So I hope I covered most of that. But there's... Yes, thank you, Dr. Fox. And you brought up, um, and we have been talking throughout this session about biosecurity. And I think this might be a good time to address some of the questions about best practices and, and how to implement biosecurity. And there's a question that's come in asking for recommendations for the proper ways to sterilize equipment and materials, tools coming in from outside sources. Dr. Baldwin, would you mind answering that for us? Yeah, absolutely, Susan. So there's really a number of ways that you can um, make sure that your equipment is clean, but you know, a simple 
bleach solution is probably going to be the easiest. There really are a lot of different solutions that can be applied that are effective against avian influenza. And Dr. Fox might know, and, and actually, Susan, you might know if those are listed on the Defend the Flock website. I don't recall if the list of, of appropriate disinfectants are listed on there, but it is important to use something that, that is effective against avian influenza. And so something like a, a bleach solution, and then like Dr. Fox already mentioned, making sure that everything has plenty of time to dry out, make sure there's no moist environment left for virus to live on there is gonna be appropriate. Uh, how about um, disinfecting vehicles during cold weather? We're here on the East Coast and we had uh, our first snowstorm. So I'm sure that this is a question that's top of mind for a lot of us on, on this side of the country. Yeah, it certainly is. And I can tackle a little bit of that first and see if Dr. Fox has anything to add. Um, this has been a challenge even out here in, in Colorado as we've been hit with avian influenza on a lot of the very large commercial facilities that we dealt with. We had anything from 105 degree weather to 40 below. And um, C and D cleaning and disinfection had to happen throughout all phases of that, regardless of what weather we were dealing with. Um, so on those larger facilities, you know, we ended up having to come up with um, different solutions with um, using, using different agents that would try to keep the um, chemicals from freezing. On you know, smaller facilities, even just keeping something inside your barn and in, or even in the house, a pump sprayer with a bleach solution to spray on tires or on the undercarriage of vehicles would be appropriate. Keeping something you know, in a warmer environment, taking it out as needed, um, and then putting it back where it's warm and not freezing is gonna be ideal. In these winter conditions, it does get really challenging for C and D to happen. On the very large commercial scale um, operations, there's a lot of other options that they can use to ensure that they have, you know, disinfectant that's working throughout all seasons. Um, I don't know, Dr. Fox, if you had anything to add on to that. Not really. The only thing I would mention is that when we're using any disinfectant, we need to make sure that we clean it first because most disinfectants, including bleach, are inactivated by dirt and, and a very large amount of fecal material. So generally, we talk about cleaning and disinfection. It's important that we do both. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Uh, I think we probably, the next question probably we're gonna send back your way, Dr. Fox, is um, are there any steps or protections that humans need to take if they come in contact or uh, have birds in their flock who are infected with HPAI? Uh, no, that's a good question. And it's certainly, it's a concern. Uh, we do wanna make sure that we do protect ourselves from anything. Right now, we know that this virus is not um, affecting humans so far, but viruses can mutate. We don't know if there's other viruses out there or what the animals actually have up until the point that we have um, some laboratory diagnostics back. So it's always better when you have um, sick or dead birds to certainly use gloves, um, wash your hands, uh, making sure you're disinfecting your boots and things like that. If you're taking care of a flock um, that you know has highly pathogenic avian influenza, it's more of a situation of, of you moving it between birds and maybe between um, the, the different facilities on your farm um, by accident than it is a, a direct um, risk to you or your family. Um, so as I mentioned before, the, the virus that we're dealing with is is very is different from the H1N1 um, that people have recently been been hearing about human cases of over in Asia and certainly we have um, much different cultural practices over here as well. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Um, probably a uh... <laughs> Sorry to keep going back to you. Probably a question. We're seeing a lot of um, inquiries related to incubated eggs. Can avian HPAI be transferred or transmitted from incubated eggs? Um, in general, we say no. Um, basically, the process of incubation is, is a heat treatment, and it will kill any virus that's on the outside of the egg. And certainly if you're, you've got virus on the inside of the egg, well, then that egg is not going to hatch. 
So um, incubation itself will, will take care of the virus on the outside of the egg. And um, if you have a live chick at the other end, then um, you know that you didn't have virus inside the egg. Now, when you're talking about things like balut or partially incubated eggs and, and eating them, um, that's different. You need to make sure that you've got um, the, the proper amount of heat to make sure that the virus isn't activated inside the egg. Um, so a virus in the interior of an egg that came from an animal that was avian influenza infected, it's very small percentage of eggs will actually have the virus inside them, but it is possible. So that's what we talk about incubation. We don't worry about eggs once they've gone to an incubator. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fox. I think we have time for probably one more question, maybe two, we'll see how it goes. Um, but we're getting variations on the question of can birds recover from HPAI? And uh, Dr. Fox will probably give you the uh, first, um, first swipe at this one. Well, certainly the, the answer is yes, but so far we've seen very few. So with low pathogenic avian influenza, birds will recover very often. You'll have some mortality, um, but most of the time these birds are, are all dying. Unfortunately, when we have had uh, mixed flocks, backyard flocks, and people were, you know, they had a couple of chickens that were, were sick first and they said, well, we wanna save these birds over here. They're not sick three or four days later, those birds are sick too. So it's possible. It's really uncommon for birds to survive, domestic birds, poultry, to just survive this virus right now, unfortunately. I don't know if Dr. Baldwin has seen anything else. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Fox. I think just to add on that, um, we haven't seen anything different really. And, and there's, uh, Susan, I've been scrolling through the questions as well. So I mean, just to give overall picture, this does have a, a mortality rate of you know, more than 90%. So we really are seeing affected birds dying at a very high rate. There is no treatment, there is no vaccination. Um, so it, this is a viral disease. It's not something that can be treated with antibiotics, for example, like bacterial infections can. So we are, we're, while we can see some flocks that may have been affected where all the birds don't die all at one time, um, we are still seeing really high mortality rates in these flocks with domestic poultry overall. Thank you, Dr. Fox. Dr. Baldwin, actually, and thank you, Dr. Fox, as well. I think um, I'd like to end on one last question, which is for um, flock for thinking about our smaller flock owners. Um, I know we talked about who to call, you know reporting sick birds, but if you if you're a veterinarian, do you need to? use a veterinarian who specializes in in poultry in avian health um how can our uh webinar participants find specialists who might understand help figure out uh what's going on here perhaps dr Baldwin will let you start with that yeah absolutely so and i know that this has been a challenge for our bird owners and backyard flock owners, because there's not a lot of avian health experts out there. There's not a lot of veterinarians that practice avian medicine, um, but there are some small animal veterinarians and mixed animal veterinarians that are beginning to see more and more birds, more and more backyard birds, because the demand is increasing. So I would say, reach out to your local veterinarians and ask the question first. Um, if you feel like your flock is sick, and you don't have a veterinarian, you can just contact us directly. It doesn't have to go through a veterinarian. You can contact the state veterinarian's office in your state or contact that USDA number that I mentioned a few slides back. Um, you can just contact the state or USDA directly if your flock is sick and they'll walk through the process of going through the diagnostic testing with you. So that might look like, if you have a private practicing veterinarian, it might look like we coordinate with your veterinarian on collecting those samples. If you don't, we might send one of our veterinarians out to collect those samples, 
or we might just have you bring that that sick bird directly to, or if you have a dead bird, bring that directly to the diagnostic laboratory. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that we can facilitate that. And it doesn't have to go through a private practicing veterinarian first, but I do encourage everybody just for good routine bird health, it's really important to have a good relationship with a private practicing veterinarian because they're also really helpful in making sure that we have the appropriate vaccinations, the appropriate treatments um, for you know, internal and external parasites that birds may get to try and keep our, our flocks healthy from things other than high path avian influenza. So if you don't already have one, it is gonna be important for you to, to hopefully try and find one locally um, that can help you through that. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Dr. Baldwin, and thank you, Dr. Fox, for sharing your, your knowledge, expertise, and compassion. So now we will switch over to share with everyone resources that um, are available through the Defend the Flock campaign uh, that contain information from growers, veterinarians, state agencies, scientists, and in industry professionals. In the next slides, we'll, we'll review the resources that flock keepers can use, as well as tools to educate others about best practices to prevent the spread of infectious diseases. APHIS Veterinary Services has developed a library of checklists that provide practical tips and recommendations. I think the, uh, Dr. Baldwin was talking about um, disinfecting solutions, and it's definitely detailed um, in, in the checklist on cleaning and disinfecting poultry enclosures, and also in the checklist for equipment and vehicles. We encourage you to visit the Defend the Flock website to view and download these materials. All of the checklists are available in multiple languages, including Spanish, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Tagalog. And this year, I'm pleased to share that we've added checklists in Hmong and Arabic. On the website, you'll find lots of other free tools, including videos, record, recordings of prior webinars like this, information cards, newsletters, posters, and other resources. Tomorrow, APHIS will officially launch the Biosecurity Workbook, a planning tool to aid poultry owners to create a biosecurity plan to help protect and care for their birds throughout the year. I think we can all agree that our youth are the future of our, nature's, of our nation's poultry farming and industry. We encourage and prepare all poultry owners, including future and aspiring growers, to be diligent about biosecurity and become a flock defender. So all of us here at, on our team are very pleased to announce that this week, APHIS is launching the new Defend the Flock, youth, D D flock Defender Youth Program. The program includes an interactive game and fun activities for all ages, such as word searches, crossword puzzles, and coloring pages. There's also a biosecurity education kit for educators and youth group leaders. The complete Flock Defender Kit is available on the APHIS website. APHIS has also created digital content to help promote biosecurity Infographics covering many best practices are available in English and Spanish. We hope you will share these with colleagues and fellow poultry keepers by email, text, or on social media to make sure everyone is using biosecurity every day, every time, no matter how many birds are in their flock. And finally, well, we hope you will follow Defend the Flock on Facebook and Twitter. As I mentioned, this is where you can get notified about when this presentation and the Q&A are available, and of course, lots more useful information. Um, again, all the questions that we were unable to get to today will be available for download from the Defend the, Defend the Flock website shortly, along with this presentation.
Finally, before we sign off, on behalf of APHIS and all of the flock keepers here today, thank you, Dr. Fox and Dr. Baldwin, for sharing your valuable insights and knowledge with us. We appreciate all that you both are doing to keep our birds safe. And thanks to all of you for joining us on this web webinar. Let's keep our flocks healthy together. Thanks so much, Susan. Thank you.